Greetings again, and welcome to our Bible class. Today's study will focus on a church festival, and it is the festival of Ascension. This is what happened 40 days after Jesus rose from the grave on Easter Sunday, and this festival is celebrated this Thursday. Uh, this is now, looking back, 40 days from Easter. Um, so this is the, the event that talks about how Jesus appeared to his disciples after he rose, and after 40, over 40 days, he, he talked with them, he ate with them, he let, him, let them touch him, he proved to them that he really had risen from the grave in his body. And after doing that, and after teaching them some more, he finally went back up into heaven. So let's begin with our study, and we're going to start off with a prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you do for us. Uh, be with us as we gather again around your word, and bless us as we come to your word. Uh, let your Holy Spirit grant us a strong faith to trust these words, and Lord, give us comfort in knowing that you are truly risen from the grave and ascended back into heaven. In your name we pray. Amen. Again, reading in Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. I wrote my first book, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began doing and teaching until the day he was taken up, after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he presented himself alive to the apostles with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and told them things about the kingdom of God. So then, who is the author of Acts, and what was the former book? We have a couple of clues in, in the lesson here. He first tells us that he had a previous book, and he tells us some of the content. He tells us that he wrote about what Jesus was doing and teaching until he was taken up. So we're thinking of a book that talked about the life of Jesus, and it finishes with Jesus' ascension. So this gets us to conclude that this is written by Luke, who is also a physician, a doctor, and he was one of Jesus' disciples. Uh, so what was the former book then? This was the Gospel of Luke he's talking about. Now, how did Jesus show his disciples that he had actually risen from the grave? Again, our lesson tells us that he presented himself alive to the apostles with many convincing proofs. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and told them things about the kingdom of God. So we could say that they saw him, they touched him, they heard him, and they ate with him. Verse 4 reads, Once when he was eating with them, he commanded them, Do not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for what the Father promised, which you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Jesus had just fulfilled his mission. He had just fulfilled so many prophecies in the Old Testament. Why didn't the disciples travel around to tell people? Like, why didn't he tell his disciples, okay, you guys go to the north, you to the south, you to the east, and you to the west, and just simply tell them to go town by town as fast as they could to spread this message that the Savior the world had been waiting for had already come. The answer is that God had a much better plan. That instead of sending the disciples out, he first would bring the world to the disciples. And he did so in a very powerful way. Before Jesus went back into heaven, he promised the disciples that the Holy Spirit would come. That he would send that Holy Spirit. And there would be this miraculous outpouring of the Holy Spirit in a powerful way. And that then the disciples could 
share the message of what Jesus had done with those who were coming into the city. So Jesus talked about what would about what was about to happen at Pentecost just a few days away. There were people that were going to come from all over the world uh, because the Jews had been spread throughout the the world at that time and they were coming into Jerusalem specifically for this high festival the festival of Pentecost now you need to understand that the festival of Pentecost was an annual thing it was an annual celebration and it always happened at the same time each year um, relative to um, their their lunar calendar and so what this means is they always expected it to come even though by our calendar these dates shift around a little bit just like easter shifts around pentecost would shift around from our perspective but in their calendar it, it was a regular thing an annual thing and it was a high festival so they would pour into jerusalem to celebrate this festival and as this happened it provided a very perfect opportunity for the gospel to spread right on the heels of Jesus, um, death, resurrection, and, and all those days that he proved himself alive, and now his ascension. On the heels of all of that, just a few days later, then this celebration would happen, and the disciples could easily share this gospel message about what Jesus had just done, and how he had fulfilled the prophecies of old. And then people would go back to their own hometowns, and this would just multiply the message. It's kind of like um, knocking down a table full of dominoes, that once you flick that first domino, if two more get knocked down, then four more, then, then 16 more, then 32 more, then it just it grows and grows and grows so quickly. And this is what this gospel message had real potential to do. And it was a, it was a perfect way to spread this amazing news very rapidly, even before the disciples themselves would do any traveling or any of the apostles um, like Paul would do any traveling. Um, the people themselves would take it back to their homes. They'd tell their families. They'd tell their neighbors. Um, they would ask questions in the synagogue and maybe search those scriptures again to see, does this add up with what we heard from those disciples there in Jerusalem? And the message could spread very rapidly. Verses 6 to 8 say, So when they were together with him, they asked, Lord, is this the time when you are going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has sent by, set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what did the disciples have in mind for Christ's kingdom? The disciples kept in mind an earthly kingdom where Jesus would kick out the governor Pontius Pilate, kick out King Herod, and kick out all the Romans under Caesar's rule, and finally make his own kingdom. Now why was this a bad question for the disciples to ask? Why or why not? Um, this was finally a bad question because the disciples knew better. Jesus had told them numerous times that he had come to open heaven for people to enter, that he came to live, to die, and to rise again, not to fight off earthly rulers. This reminds us of how slow we ourselves can be to believe what God says. It also reminds us to listen to God's word and not to our own presuppositions. You might be amazed at just how often we write our own beliefs, at just how many presuppositions we might bring to the table. Um, in the absence of God's word, we invent theology. We invent what we believe and what we choose to believe and why. Um, so it's also an encouragement that we need to stay into God's word. And if we're not constantly flipping those pages and reviewing even those familiar things, then soon enough they become less familiar and then 
totally unfamiliar. And those important teachings of Scripture, they can, they can be lost, they can be replaced by new ideas. And whether it's an idea that we hear on the television or over the radio or um, an idea we just hear talking with a friend, or finally, even if it's nobody else around us, even if the world doesn't affect us at all, if we turn off all the technology and we don't talk to anybody else, we don't read any books or, or listen to any other ideas, if we just sit there, even then, we tend to invent our own theologies. So what we forget from the Bible soon we replace with, you know, I think this or I think that, and, and, and we just can invent things along the way. And if we're not comparing it against the truth and constantly submitting ourselves to that, then we can come up with all sorts of terrible, evil teachings uh, that lead people away from Jesus, away from the truth, and away from the only way to salvation. Now, give me, I can give you a couple of examples just, just for the sake of argument. Um, somebody could say, I think that it's wrong to, to hurt someone. Okay, so now we can flip to scripture, and certainly there are many passages that would tell us you shouldn't hurt people. You shouldn't be damaging people's property, you shouldn't be taking things from them, and you shouldn't be either physically or verbally abusive. There are plenty of passages we could point to to make that point. But if you set the Bible aside, and then you come to the conclusion on your own, well, I, sh I shouldn't hurt people, um, your rationale is just a, a feeling. Um, it might be true. It might be based on something that you already know naturally in your heart, but it takes a step away from God's word, and that's not where you want to be. Because soon enough you might say, well, maybe hurting people isn't so bad as long as you're not hurting them physically. You know, you could easily say, well, maybe it just, it, it only matters if if you've damaged them in a physical way, but maybe emotional abuse or something doesn't really matter. It's not a big deal if I yell at my wife or something. We might come to that conclusion. And now that we've taken a step away from Scripture, we have nothing to correct ourselves with. We don't have that mirror of, of God's law to show us what we actually look like, to, to compare ourselves with His perfection and and strive for that perfection. Um, soon enough, we start to look around and say, you know, there's there's plenty of uh, abuse all around in the world. Everyone's doing it, and what's the big deal? Um, you know, I, I may be an angry person. I may be verbally abusive. I may use all kinds of foul language, we might reason, but then say, well, you know, at least I'm not actually hitting people and hurting people physically. Um, we might rationalize things that way. Uh, so my, my, my point in all this is just to say that um, we need to stick with God's word in order to stick with the truth. Now, why even mention this at all? Uh, because Jesus' own disciples had heard from Jesus' own mouth that he was going to go to Jerusalem to, to suffer and die, and then on the third day to rise again. And you he heard his disciples first being confused, then understanding, but then Peter saying, no, Lord, this is never going to happen. And they understood, they just wouldn't receive it. And even now that it was 40 days after his resurrection, they had, they knew he went to Jerusalem. He did die just like he said he would. He carried out all these prophecies and he rose again just like he promised. And even now, they still couldn't get over this idea. Are you, Jesus, going to now establish your earthly kingdom? And the answer was no. It wasn't what he had come to do. He had a, a far greater goal in mind. And he had a, a much different mission for his disciples than what they had envisioned. They envisioned this, this future where they'd be right at Jesus' side, um, maybe having to swing the sword a little bit, and maybe having to spill some blood a little bit, and rallying other people to do the same, if necessary, and drive the Romans out. And that once all the, 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 the dust cleared, and the Romans were finally driven out, then they figured, 
Jesus was going to put that crown on, that golden crown, sit in a palace, and that they themselves would be able to sit right there along with him, be among his council, uh, taking those highest positions of authority, and become earthly, wealthy, influential rulers, and do, the th do things the way that they thought they ought to be done. None of that was in Jesus' plan. In fact, um, most of Jesus' disciples ended up being uh, persecuted, rejected, and, and uh, martyrs for the church. Quite the opposite of what they were expecting. So Jesus had much higher plans for them and for the Christian church. Uh, much different than the kind of things that the world prizes. Uh, Jesus shows himself to be a different kind of king altogether. And now we look at verses 9 to 12. It says, After he said these things, he was taken up while they were watching in a cloud, and a cloud took him out of their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he went away. Suddenly, two men in white clothes stood beside them. They said, Men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking up into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mountain called the Mount of Olives, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath, day, a Sabbath day's journey away. So how did Jesus finally leave after his resurrection? We've got a clue there in the picture. Jesus went back up into heaven. Uh, and, and then along with his ascension back into heaven, what promise or promises did Jesus leave his disciples with? And then also, what did the angels promise? Well, there were a couple of promises. First, that Jesus' disciples would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and that Jesus would come back someday in the very same way that he had left. Or we might say in the opposite way, um, that he was going up into heaven in this cloud and that someday he was going to come back down from heaven again and with the clouds and uh, he would be coming at the last day in, in judgment. So it helps us if we understand more details about Jesus ascension into heaven it's going to help us understand some more details about the last day again this is from a lesson we had recently jesus says in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so i would have told you i'm going to prepare a place for you and if i go and prepare a place for you i will come again and take you to be with me so that you may come you may also be where i am so how is it a comfort that Jesus has gone to heaven? Jesus is preparing our heavenly home. He is coming back to take us there. And because he sends the Holy Spirit. We can also look at Matthew 28, verse 20, uh, the second half of verse 20, where Jesus promises, And surely I am with you always until the end of the age. And that tells us that Jesus is still with us always. Uh, as true God, even now, Jesus still fills heaven and earth. Now you might think to yourself, wait a minute, we just talked about how Jesus went back into heaven, and he said he was going away, and that he was going to be coming back. But now we're saying Jesus is somehow still with us. And the answer is yes. Uh, there are different different modes of God's presence. And what we're talking about here is that God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. And even though Jesus has ascended bodily into heaven to sit on his throne, to prepare a place for us, to eventually come back for us, um, even though all of that's true, Jesus, in a different kind of way, is also still everywhere. And, and he says that he is actually here still with us, still by our side, still not only looking down on us, but really walking with us and, 
and being right here through all the troubles of life, certainly protecting us from harm and danger and evil, but also guiding us through those things at times as well. Hebrews 12 verse 2 says this, In view of the joy set before him, he, that is Jesus, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of God's throne. So this tells us that Jesus now rules over the church for our good right now. And he does that by sitting at God's right hand. That is to say, he sits in power. He sits in this position of authority in heaven. We might say it this way, that Jesus is God's right hand man, or he's the, he's the one who sits on the side of God's strength and power. Uh, just like, um, just like somebody might say, I lifted that with my good arm or my strong arm. Um, that's the that's the image that's being used here. Is that that God's right hand is a place of God's strength and His power, and there's no weakness there whatsoever. And that's where Jesus is. So then there are a lot of comforts in knowing that Jesus has actually ascended into heaven. It's, it's a comfort to know that he is preparing a place for us, that he is watching over us, that he is sitting there in power, guiding his church even now, uh, that he cares for us. Um, it also certainly is a call for, for evangelism because God has entrusted to us this gospel message about Jesus and he has given us this mission that we are to now spread Jesus throughout the world. And, and um, this was not something that, that God chose to give to the angels. It wasn't something that Jesus decided to stick around for and do personally all by himself. Um, he could have done either of those things, but instead he said, No, I'm going to work through my church, through my people, uh, working in the hearts of Christians and using these interpersonal relationships one by one to bring people to faith to hear this message about what i've done and so then it is it is a call as a christian to carry out this mission of the church to, to actually go into all the world um, and spread this good news at the same time going into all the world doesn't mean that you as a personal individual need to travel the entire globe what it means is you need to be that next domino in the chain, so to speak, that even if you uh, affect a handful of people around you, and then they, they, they pass that message on to another handful, that things can spread very rapidly. And that you don't have to know every language, you don't have to travel to every country, but you can just be a Christian right where you're at right now. And that's true whether or not there's a move coming up for you or whether you just moved, um, that you carry this gospel with you no matter where you are. Um, and when it comes to family, let's say you do move, well, you'd still have those family ties, even if it means uh, vacation time and phone calls. Even though you're at a distance, eventually you're going to come back together again and see these people. Um, on the other hand, when it comes to friends and, and co-workers, those may change over time. And I guess it's all the more encouragement to seize the day because you never know what may happen. Um, the, the life we're now living in this shutdown is certainly a, a stark reminder that things can change very rapidly and in a drastic way. Um, all of a sudden, door-to-door -door evangelism doesn't make any sense. All of a sudden, um, there's lots of natural connections we might have had, even with friends or family, that now we're putting ourselves intentionally at a distance. Um, so you need to reevaluate how you're going to share that message. Uh, for now, um, you can still certainly take the opportunity with the people of your own household to keep on doing your daily devotions, uh, to keep on sharing those Bible stories, whether at, at dinner or whether at bedtime or whenever it is you have your routines. Certainly say your prayers and, and echo back to God the promises that he has made to you. Certainly open those devotional books, those magazines. Uh, there's 
plenty of stuff you can get nowadays from NPH, uh, our publishing house. And whether it's videos or devotionals or, um, you know, it could be wall art. There's a lot of different ways that, that we, we reach people with the gospel. And that includes reaching our own families within our own homes. Also, don't sell short the idea that you could ship something to somebody that you care about. Uh, you could give them a gift, for example, and if it is a devotional, um, that is something that they could still read in their own home, safe and, and uh, still be able to reach them with the gospel. You can certainly call people on the phone still. Um, and even right now, we, we can use the internet and, and communicate as best we can. Um, while we need to do it this way, um, there are certainly, um, you know, different ways to video chat online and you can use those too. I mean, my family and I were regularly doing that even before all this, but now all the more reason to stay connected as much as we can, uh, while we're forced to be apart. But one way or another, uh, think through these ways that, that you can communicate and, and, and develop those relationships you have and to use those relationships you have as a bridge to share the gospel. Um, finally, when all of this clears, we're going to be able to go back to uh, eventually those normal, regular means of communication and seeing people face to face and, and inviting them to, to, to parties and luncheons and uh, fun festivals and all the all the other things that we do as we gather together and I, I'm very much looking forward to that but for the time being um, I want you to be content in knowing that God is still at work among his world that he is still able to use us his people to spread this truth about what he has done to save us and and I think even for a while now it's maybe a good thing to remember that we are still the church even when we can't meet physically in our regular church building. Um, that we are still Christians even when we're not at that physical place there on Main Street. Um, and, and that's a good thing. Um, Christ's kingdom will still come. It will still expand throughout this world. And then when we come back together, we can certainly appreciate those blessings of gathering together, um, but it's not a physical place or, or, or a physical building that makes us who we are. It's the gospel. It's the good news about Jesus that we carry in our hearts who makes us who we are and what we are. And, and it's the Holy Spirit that works through the message we proclaim to further God's kingdom on this earth. So my prayer is that you are comforted in knowing that your God still he is still watching out for you. He is still providing for you. He is still with you, still working through you. And that even if you are just simply sitting at home, sort of getting by from one day to the next, um, just sort of waiting things out here, even if that's your case, um, God still has a plan and a purpose for you uh, day by day. And that these days don't need to be wasted. Um, you can still use this time to grow in God's word, to grow in faith, to grow in your relationship with God and with those who you do, do still have a connection to. And may God richly bless you um, as you take advantage of those opportunities until at last we can meet again face to face. God be with you.